Good afternoon, and to our colleagues on the West Coast, good morning, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Brace for Impact. I have a few items to review with you before we start. CHES credits are available for this webinar upon completion of the evaluation at the end of this meeting. Your feedback will help us provide targeted, high-quality webinars and trainings to you. Please follow the instructions here and at the end of the meeting in order to receive your credits. We want to answer all of your questions during today's session. You can ask questions in two ways. You can type your questions in the chat box and they will be read aloud during the question and answer period as time permits, or you can wait until the end of the presentation to ask them aloud. The operator will provide instructions on how to do this. The recording will also be available on NPEN's website. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Kay Smith. After more than 40 years' experience as an instructor, publisher, technical writer-editor, and other positions, Kay Smith is currently the Senior Technical Writer-Editor in CDC's National Center for HIV-AIDS, Viral Hepatitis, STD, and TB Prevention's or NCHHSTP's Office of the Associate Director for Science. After many years working with the Air Force and the Indian Health Service, she came to CDC in 1997. Kay first served in NCHHSTP's Division of HIV AIDS Prevention as a training specialist until becoming Deputy Branch Chief and Team Lead of the MMWR Serial Publications. In 2005, she joined the newly created Office of Workforce and Career Development as the lead health communication specialist until early 2015 when she rejoined NCHHSTP. Kay, I'll turn the meeting over to you. Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending today. I've used Brace for Impact as the title of my presentation today because it's been called a perfect sentence. It contains no adjectives, adverbs, or prepositional phrases. It's, a, it's an active voice, and it cannot be phrased any clearer. In fact, it can be easily understood by a second grader. Most importantly, though, it's actionable. These were the words of Captain Chesley Sully Sullenberger, Cactus Flight 1549, on January 15, 2009, at about 3.30 p.m., less than five minutes after takeoff from New York's LaGuardia Airport, during which the aircraft struck a large flock of Canada geese, disabling both engines. As soon as Captain Sully announced to the passengers and cabin crew, this is your captain, brace for impact. The flight attendants immediately began shouting in unison to the passengers, heads down, stay down, heads down, stay down. Those were the only words the passengers heard just before Captain Sully landed the plane on the Hudson River in New Jersey. Captain Sully's simple, direct words, plus his flying ability, of course, and the actions of the flight crew saved 155 lives that day. Everyone survived the miracle on the Hudson. If the passengers and crew had been MMWR editors and Captain Sully had read their instructions to authors, this is what he might have said instead. I'll give you a second to read that slide. All of these details were included in the NTSB investigation report after the event. But if Captain Sully had said all of this in the moment, the airplane would have been in the Hudson and no one would have braced for impact. About now, you're probably wondering, what does the miracle on the Hudson have to do with us? We're here today to talk about how we give our health communication messages and campaigns more impact. Like Captain Sully and his crew, we perform actions every day to try to save lives. Our words might not have the same immediacy that his did that day, but we want our messages to be actionable and to save lives. 
So today we'll discuss some of the principles that give written and oral communication impact, an easy technique for giving health communication piece, your health communication piece impact, and ways in which we diminish the potential impact of our products, and ways to enhance the impact. Everyone attending this session today is probably involved one way or another in producing your organization's most important product, information. All of us are either in the business of generating information or we're in the business of making that information clearer and more meaningful to the audience or in distributing that information to those who need it. The recipients of the information, our customers, are either our colleagues or someone outside our organization, whether that person is a public health professional or a member of the public. However, even the most important information will not have any impact if we cannot get the intended audience to read it, understand it, and act on it. So how can we accomplish that better than we already do? One of the most common ways we reach our audience is through the hundreds of journal articles and MMWRs we publish each year. Each journal article or MMWR serves a particular purpose and is of particular interest to healthcare providers and public health officials and sometimes to the public. Anyone can find them through indexing services like PubMed or Scopus or for CDC authored products through CDC Stack. We hope these papers produce some kind of action by readers, if only prompting additional studies to answer a specific health-related question. Today, though, we're here mainly to talk about the other kinds of information products we produce. How can we engage readers who find those products through a search engine or by going directly to a web page? And how can we increase the chances that readers will act on the information we provide? That is, how do we ensure that our products will have impact? One way to grab and hold people's attention is through storytelling. Let's return to the MMWR for just a moment. It has a journal impact factor of 12.888, which makes it a top-ranked journal. What makes it so popular and well-respected? Besides being the voice of CDC, MMWR tells the stories of those who have become ill or injured. They tell how the person became ill or injured, what can be done about it, and what needs to be done to stop it from happening to others. One important difference, however, is that MMWR does it without any emotional descriptions. They're strictly clinical in their storytelling because they are primarily speaking to clinicians around the world. But we have a little bit more flexibility with our other information products. Let's look at two examples of how storytelling can lead to success. In her recent best-selling book, Doris Kearns Goodwin, White House historian, recounts how two of our greatest presidents, Abraham Lincoln and Theodore Roosevelt, achieved their goals in part because of their storytelling ability. According to Goodwin, both Lincoln and Roosevelt overcame their limitations of birth. Lincoln's poverty and lack of a formal education and Roosevelt's extremely poor health during childhood. To become great leaders because they were able to draw in and motivate any audience through their ability to tell stories and humorous anecdotes. Moving closer to home, here we have two excellent examples of health communication campaigns. necessary elements that are relatable, the people in the images and stories remind us of people we know, they're relevant, 
we frequently hear about the dangers of STDs, and although smoking has decreased substantially, people are still dying every day from smoking-related illnesses. They are emotional. The images and stories are intended to touch our emotions and, in the case of the former smokers, to be shocking. And they're engaging. Both campaigns pull us in, pull us in and we want to read more or to learn what happens to that person at the end of the message. Sometimes in the Kids from Former Smokers campaign, this principle applies. What do you think? Would this approach work for you or do you prefer a more positive approach? Why does storytelling give a communication product more impact? Storytelling works because it humanizes the content. You can tell a story, for example, through the experiences of a real but de-identified patient or client, through the experience of an epidemiologist conducting an outbreak investigation, or through a key event in public health such as an unexpected and unexplained increase in cases of a particular infection. If you do decide to tell a story, you must follow the tried and true principles that make storytelling work. To hook the audience, storytelling must follow the same three acts structure that Hollywood screenplays follow. This, this structure is as old as storytelling itself. You probably remember the adventures described in the Odyssey by Homer from the 8th century BC. Each of those stories follows the same three-act structure, and each story is just as popular today. That's why Hollywood keeps using the same stories of Ulysses over and over. They just change the characters' names, the costumes, and the settings, but the plot lines are the same. Now think back for a moment to the tips from Former Smokers Campaign. In the first act, we're introduced to the person and given enough of a glimpse of his or her life before becoming ill to make that person relatable. In the second act, we learn about the health problem that was caused by smoking and the tribulations the problem caused. And finally, in the third act, we learn the outcome. All of this in a 20 to 30 second PSA. The three act structure relates to the rule of three, which you might have studied in your college courses. The rule of three is the universal principle that anything that comes in threes is more satisfying, more effective, and more memorable. <clears throat> Even if you believe the storytelling mechanism might not work for, for you, you can still give your message impact by following the rule of three. Threes are pervasive throughout literature. The Three Little Pigs, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, The Three Musketeers, and even The Three Stooges. Shakespeare knew the effectiveness of the rule of three and followed it in all, all of his plays, whether it was a comedy, drama, or history. Have you ever noticed that this is the device that all comedians use in their routines? Regardless of your communication medium, remember that following the rule of three will give your message more impact. Turning back to storytelling now, to have impact, the story you tell must have suspense. Your character must have a serious problem to face and the outcome must be in doubt. For example, your character is hesitant about getting tested because she knows her life might change forever if the results are bad news. Next, your story must trigger a release of oxytocin in the brain by having the dramatic art that includes tension, struggle, and a happy ending, or be a warning to others. After your character makes the tough decision to get tested, she finds out the results are negative this time, and she resolves to be safer next time. Before we 
Really engaging your audience with the story requires seven elements. It must have a beginning, middle, and end. It must be thought-provoking, new, interesting, and entertaining. The characters, setting, and challenges must feel real. It must include relevant but not superfluous details. For example, the, the best authors of both fiction and nonfiction always include many small details in the narrative. Those details might seem irrelevant at the time, but by the end of the story, all those small details have become threads woven into a tapestry. Your story should have a twist or surprise. This usually comes at the peak of the story. The story must include relatable characters. The audience must be able to see themselves in the central character's shoes. Finally, the story must include conflict or tension that the, the central character overcomes. How you tell the story, that is, the words you use and how well you use them, are as important as the story itself. The story must be told in terms the audience can easily understand and follow without getting lost in the storyline. This does not mean dumbing down the message. It does mean telling the story with enthusiasm and linking the concept to something in culture that the audience readily understands. For example, if we're trying to convince adolescents to practice healthy lifestyles, we must tell them a story that seems as if it is about someone they know, a friend, a cousin, or the star football player, and speak to them on their grade level. The story cannot be filled with medical jargon or abbreviations they do not recognize. Although storytelling might not work for every information product you design, you still want to avoid having your audience feel this way about your communication efforts. For example, sometimes we fall in the habit of using words that have a specific meaning in our technical field, but that others might find overinflated or pretentious. Two, terms, two such terms are utilize and utilization, which are common in information technology literature, but they're overkill for other purposes. Or we use terms the way we learn them in school. For example, we might use whilst or amongst, which are British English, when our audience is more attuned to American English. Some writers like to use a word that they think sounds more correct than another term. For example, they might like to say, should you have any questions, instead of simply saying, if you have any questions. But should and if are not synonyms. When we misuse words, we make readers or listeners have to work harder to understand our meaning and our message loses its impact. We might inadvertently create a list that is not parallel in structure. In example one here, the last item is not equivalent to the other items in the series, and such an error might even make our readers laugh at our illogical thinking. This sentence might be corrected in several different ways, but one easy way would be to say instead, NCHHSTP focuses on youth risk behavior and on the infectious diseases of. Likewise, the non-parallel item in the last bullet in example two can cause confusion and possible misunderstanding. Although all of the items begin with verbs, which you might think makes the list parallel, the last item is a different verb form from the other two. In this instance, changing publicizing to publicize will fix this fault. A much more serious impact killer is using pejorative language. We all know to avoid using sexist or gender-specific terms, such as only using the masculine form when both males and females are involved. And I'm sure you already know ways to avoid that kind of pejorative language. 
but without realizing it, you might be using other terms that have a pejorative connotation. For example, are you using subgroup or subpopulation when referring to selected subjects who are part of a larger group? If so, think about what you're saying to the people who identify with the members of those groups. You're telling them that they are beneath or subordinate to the overall group. Are you referring to persons age 65 years or older as elderly instead of using older or simply stating the age group in years? And a term I am particularly sensitive about is Americans, as in our mission is improving the health of Americans. Being a citizen should have nothing to do with the health care or saving lives. Therefore, using U.S. residents is much more inclusive of all those persons whose health we care about. A really effective health message begins with the title or tagline that immediately captures the audience's attention, that is prudent and thoughtful, and that is socially conscious. If you're unsure about how your information product or health campaign title or tagline might be perceived, show it to others who can give you an, impar an impartial opinion. Ask them what they would expect to learn from the campaign. If their answers are not what you intended, rethink your title or tagline. Here is an example from the private sector of a campaign that was a colossal failure. Perhaps Bloomingdale should have tested the, this magazine ad much more thoroughly before publishing it. In the era of the Me Too movement, this ad might have been relatable, relevant, emotional, and engaging, but not in the way Bloomingdale's intended. It instantly backfired on them and social media exploded with outrage. Instead of letting mistakes or misguided intentions diminish our impact, though, we can work to ensure that our messages have impact. Because punctuation marks tell us when to pause, come to a full stop, or note something in particular, they must be used correctly. Readers might not know the exact rules of punctuation, but they recognize when an incorrect mark causes them to misread something or to have to go back and read it over and over to understand the meaning. We could talk all day about punctuation errors, but one example of frequently misused punctuation is the exclamation point. Its overuse has caused it to have the opposite effect from the excitement it's meant to convey. Style manuals usually recommend that it should be used sparingly, if at all. If you're ever unsure about how you're using punctuation marks, refer to a standard grammar guide. Even simple, quick guides can help you better understand and follow the rules. I'm also available if you ever have a punctuation problem that has you stumped. As a side note, Misused capitalization can also cause your product to lose impact. Color conveys meanings, and those meanings can vary by culture. We do not have time today to go into all the nuances of different colors and their meanings, but I recommend that you do some research before deciding on the colors you want to use. At CDC, we have specific colors we're supposed to use for our branding purposes, and many in this group are already familiar with those. Those of you in other organizations might also have such restrictions on the colors you use, and you should adhere to those. To have impact, your information product must be free of errors. Editing and proofreading your own work is difficult, but the three techniques listed on the left side of this slide can help you. To edit and proofread effectively, perform three separate reviews in any order that, that suits you. For one review, focus only on the formatting. For example, is it consistent in type size, color, and style? And does it lead your audience through the content by using a progression of heading levels? 
For a second review, focus on the accuracy and consistency of terminology and numbers. Have you avoided using medical or media jargon, and have you double-checked the calculations? For a third review, focus on the grammar, punctuation, capitalization, and spelling. Check the subject-verb agreement, pronoun reference, dangling modifiers, and faulty parallelism. Whatever you do, do not depend on Microsoft's grammar checker. If you're uncertain about the rules, check a standard reference guide. After your proofreading, let your product rest for a few days or at least a week if you can. A fresh look will help you see aspects of the product you did not see before, and you will have thought of some new ideas while the product rested. Asking an impartial colleague to read your, your draft always helps too, because their fresh eyes can spot problem areas you simply cannot see any longer. You might want to do, to do this both before clearance and again after final changes have been made. Even the best writers should edit their work again and again. With each edit, the goal should be to make it more concise each time. As a final thought, as you develop your next health message, I hope you will consider making it relatable, relevant, engaging, and maybe even a little emotional. In doing so, your audience just might say, this information saved my life. I'm grateful to the authors of these two sources for much of the material I've shared with you today. Both of these books are relatable, relevant, emotional, and highly engaging. Thank you. I hope you find these ideas helpful in designing your own health messages and appraising messages of, from others. I'll be happy to take any questions you might have. Our comments, if anybody has any experiences they would like to share, we have plenty of time and you're welcome to share them. Aaron, if you can open up the lines for questions. Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a question over the phone, you may signal by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. I think that's star 1 over the phones, and we'll pause for just a moment. Hi, Kay. We have a question. If you could please flip back to the references. Okay. excellent books. Thank you. They're both page turners, actually. <laughs> Even for nonfiction books, they're page turners. They will be. Yeah, they, are, they will be provided, right? The recording will be provided. Can we get a, I'm sorry. Can you provide other examples of pejorative terms for subgroups? Um, one term that um, strikes me quite often in the materials that I edit um, that I have learned from the editors of textbooks that I often work with, to call a country a developing country, you know, we used to refer to other countries as third world countries. I think we've all learned not to refer to other countries as third world countries now. But we're still often using the term developing countries. Well, everybody has an economy that is still developing, even the United States. So rather than using developing countries, um, just note what the socio socioeconomic status of that country is. And there are plenty of websites available, good, reliable websites, where you can um, actually locate how a country is classified. For example, the World Bank website lists the rankings of all the different countries. So in other words, use concrete terms 
without using pejorative language to describe other countries. So that's one that comes to mind. Thanks, Kay. Uh, another question we have is, can you talk about tools to assess grade level reading? Um, I use the very old FOG index. And if anyone would like to contact me, I'll be happy to send you the directions of doing a, a manual FOG index. I find that words uh, analysis of the grade level um, is not reliable, um, especially for the kinds of literature that we deal with. Um, so I just like to use um, the very old fog index, it's a little labor intensive, but I've always found that it's much more reliable. Okay. Uh, maybe some others um, have some, um, some favorite tools that they like. And I, I know that there's a world of them out there and maybe for your own particular purpose, you just have to test a few of them and see what you think about the results. I just know that words Word count function is not exactly accurate, which, which can throw off the, um, the grade level that it gives you back. And it's just, just unreliable. It's a tool that most of us have to use. But um, there are better tools for determining grade level out there. Thanks, Kay. Can you go two slides over to the Ches credit slide? Mm -hmm. Great, and we have another question here. Could you provide an example of a poor use of capitalization? Mm. Boy, can I ever. I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> I quite often um, receive things to edit, and it's almost like the author has put capital letters in a salt shaker and just sprinkled them all over the paper. Um, they think that because a word seems important, it should be capitalized. Or another instance is they want to use an acronym, and obviously the acronym is in full caps, but they think because the acronym is capitalized that the term it stands for should also be capitalized. But that's, that's not the case. And what happens many times is when you misuse capitalization, you start out capitalizing something because you think it's important and it should be in capital letters, and then you forget that you've done that. And a few pages over in your product, you forget that you were capitalizing it because it really shouldn't be capitalized, and you start lower casing it. That really confuses readers. Thanks, Kay. I would like a tool for reading level in Spanish. Any recommendations on this or on health literacy authors in Spanish? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I could do a little research if you send me an email. I'll be happy to look into that question and send you an answer. Um, but unfortunately, and much to my regret, I am not a Spanish language expert, and uh, when, when I have to translate something from Spanish, frankly, I usually use the Google Translate tool or the translation tool at dictionary.com. I find it to be very helpful, but it's not a true one-to-one, -one, and it certainly doesn't give you the nuances of uh, translating something uh, from one language to another. I do know from experience, though, that when you have a product in English and you're translating it to another language, you also have to back translate that product to ensure that it was translated accurately and that uh, the meanings don't get misconstrued. Thanks. Um, any thoughts on how we can encourage people with low health literacy to seek and accept reliable, helpful health information? I have to go back to the main topic of discussion today. I think if you're working with someone who has low health literacy, by using the storytelling techniques and making it really relatable to that person's environment and culture, 
that that's the best way to get your message across. Hi, Aaron. Um, do we have any questions on the phone line? Yes, sir. We do have one question. We'll go to Melanie Stone. Hello. Hello. Hi. I was wondering if I could get certification, not just chest credits, but also CPC, as well as it cut out quite often. Is it possible to get this presentation so I could share with my team? I understand that the presentation uh, has been recorded and I believe it will be distributed through the NPIN network. Uh, is, is that correct? Yes, so the presentation itself will not be sent out to participants. However, once the link is finished, we will provide that. Um, I will send that link out to you guys once the link is available. You will then be able to rewatch the entire presentation with live captioning. And I, I apologize. For if the sound quality was not what it should be for you, I apologize. Oh, that's okay. It's not your uh, fault. <laughs> okay. I think we have some more questions. Karen, do we have any other questions on the phone lines? No further phone questions at this time. Okay, we have some more questions here in the chat box. Is there a reference um, that you can recommend for capitalization rules? Oh, I, I have many different references I, I could recommend, uh, but two in particular, well, okay, three. Three of my favorites. First of all, the government publication manual, the, the GPO, the Government Printing Manual, uh, which is available online. Uh, that one contains all the rules for correct capitalization and it includes many, many pages of examples. Another great reference for both uh, capitalization, punctuation, style, word usage, all of that my favorite book probably is Garner's Modern, Modern English Usage. Um, that's a hardbound book or you can get it to electronically to download to your Kindle app, for example. It is an encyclopedia of grammar usage. It's very reasonably priced, um, but it contains enough information. You could just sit there and read that book forever and ever and ever. Uh, it gives you examples after examples of examples. And then another uh, guide that is, it's been around for a really long time, but it's an excellent guide, and that's the Harbrace Handbook. Again, it's very inexpensive, um, but it contains all the rules, very easily explained, and if you follow the Harbright's Handbook, you'll never go wrong. So those, those are just three. I have shelves full of great reference books about all these subjects, though. Great. Thanks, Kay. I think you answered another question here that came in for recommending a standard grammar guide resource. And also, um, you can get these very inexpensive quick guides, and I, I bet you've seen them in bookstores. They're plastic coated, and usually they're like four pages folded together. They make some fantastic quick guides, very inexpensive. I'm talking like around $5 on all of these different subjects, capitalization, punctuation, grammar, English usage. Um, if you don't want to invest a lot of money and you want something that you can read and comprehend very quickly, I recommend those quick guides. Okay. So one more here. Do you have any tips for punctuation and bulleted lists? Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> now, in written literature, I always follow the rule that 
you do not capitalize the first word of each bulleted item if that item is the continuation of the lead-in sentence. And you only use a colon if you've used the words as follows or in the following. Also, the in punctuation, if it's a continuation of the lead-in sentence, use whatever punctuation is most appropriate and use a conjunction before the last uh, item. If you think back, let me flip back to the slide with um, the non-parallel structure. For example, if you look at example two, that's a good example of punctuating and capitalizing a bulleted list. Now, if the lead-in sentence is a complete thought and each bulleted item is a complete thought, capitalize it and put a period at the end. Now, when I tell you all those rules, though, remember that that's for literature that is being printed or read in Word, whatever. We don't follow those rules for slides uh, for web pages a lot of times. Uh, but if you think in terms of the bulleted list being read exactly the way it is if it were run into the paragraph, that makes the rules for punctuating and capitalizing bulleted lists very simple and easy to follow. Thanks. Uh, one last here, I think. Could you comment on the use of white space in our guidelines for white space and educational resources? Well, you have to find a happy medium for white space. Too much white space makes something appear very gappy, makes it very hard to read. But you do want good wide margins, and you want nice line spaces between the content. So I strongly recommend judicious use of white space. For example, if I'm editing something, I always include a blank line space between the introductory lead-in sentence and then the bulleted list and then another blank line space. I just don't think that we can underestimate the value of including blank line spaces in text. The last question here. Do you have any recommendations for use with physicians on how to improve cultural competency to improve health literacy of patients? Uh, yes, I, I have one big recommendation. I have plenty of printed literature that the patient can take home with them and make sure that no matter what the reading level of that patient is, make sure that that literature is written in simple, easy to understand language. When a patient is in a physician's office, I don't care what the problem is, the patient is nervous, they get home, they can't remember exactly what it was the physician said. The physician told them the name of the disease that they have, that that goes in one ear and out the other. They, they can't remember, and so many of the infections sound the same. So there's no substitute for having simple, easy to understand printed literature that someone can take home with them. Aaron, do we have any other questions on the phone lines? Apparently no questions in queue, sir. So some other questions came through. Um, some questions about tools for determining the reading level of your written document. At CDC, we use Visible Thread and you can have a 30-day trial subscription on that. Who makes that software? I'm not familiar with that one. I'm not sure. sure. But um, it's what we use here to scan our web documents. Oh, very good. Mm -hmm. Visible thread. I'd like to mm -hmm. check that out. Sure. And what about the use of infographics? How do the concepts, if at all, apply? 
That's an interesting question, very interesting question. Um, and as a matter of fact, I listened to an interview with an expert on National Public Radio just the other day about this. The world is moving more and more toward infographics. But your infographics have to be simple and easy to comprehend at a glance. They cannot be too complicated. Uh, they have to be very well designed. Rather than having one infographic with all the data crammed into it, for example, it helps readers if you break that down into separate graphics, very simple, easy to comprehend graphics. Um, but one thing this expert was saying the other day that I found very interesting, what he recommends is that before you start writing any type of information product that you actually sit down, it's called back of the napkin technique, you sit down and by hand draw out very simple little figures about the story that you want to tell. And when you can draw that out, it will help you organize all of your thoughts and it will help you communicate with any audience much better. And I thought that's a technique I'm definitely going to use the next time. All right, Aaron, we'll go back to the phone line to see if there are any other questions in queue. No questions in queue at this time, sir. Okay, I, I think that uh, concludes the presentation for today. Thank you so much for attending, and uh, please don't hesitate to contact me if I can be of any assistance to you. Thank you. Goodbye.